The Geopolitics and Empire podcast is joined by Ron Unz. He is a theoretical physicist by training, has worked in the financial services software industry and became involved in politics and public policy activities. He founded the Unz Review in, I believe, 2013, which garners a lot of traffic and is widely read. Welcome to Geopolitics and Empire, Mr. Unz. Hey, great to be here. Yeah, good to have you. Uh, and just Just a few quick announcements before we uh, begin. Uh, tomorrow, actually, I am released from YouTube prison as my second first strike in a row will expire. I'm not sure if I will post this contra controversial interview with Ron in full on, <laughs> on Pentagon too, but listeners know they can find it on all podcast pop platforms and now the five video platforms of Odyssey, Rumble, Rockfin, BitChute, and Brighton. And the brand new website for Geopolitics and Empire has just gone live. You can find it at Geopolitics geopoliticsandempire.com. There's a new membership option there to help support the podcast and get access to my new brief weekly podcast commentary, monthly newsletter, private telegram, and monthly group call with members. All of this both in English and Spanish. Now, back to Mr. Unz, uh, who will be discussing his take on the origins of the pandemic, how deadly he deems the pandemic to be, the efficacy of the vaccines, the new Cold War with China, and so forth. Just real quick, my view is that There is no way any of this to me was natural uh, or accidental or spontaneous. Given all the evidence we have seen the past few years, I can only interpret the pandemic as a planned uh, event. For me, the question then becomes planned by who, what is the nature exactly of the pandemic and to what end? I initially viewed it as a biological warfare attack by the West against the East. I also entertain the idea that it could be a biological attack by the East against the West. But given the global coordination we've been seeing lately by all nations uh, against their own peoples, I'm starting to view it as an attack by ruling elites around the globe uh, on their own populations, as George Orwell wrote in 1984. Uh, I tend to believe that we are not in a pandemic uh, by definition. I question whether there is a virus at all. Um, and that it's possible many events were manufactured, but I'm still not sure. And I'm, of course, open to the idea that there was a gain of function, uh, a virus. I view the vaccines as, as dangerous and possibly as a bioweapon, as some people have said, such as Francis Boyle. Uh, but more importantly for me, I'm afraid of the th that it created a pretext for the installation of a Chinese style social credit digital passport uh, kind of system. So that, those are my two cents. And I know on the UNS review, you have given platform to a wide range of views on the matter which is fantastic and how media should be. Mike Whitney has been a prolific commentator on your site, and you but you disagree with him on many points. So we're ready for your take on, on COVID-19. I believe you believe it was a biowarfare attack against uh, by the West against China and Iran, among others, that the pandemic health threat is serious and that there is little evidence demonstrating the vaccines uh, are harmful. Um, I'm not really here to debate, but just for you to give us your data dump. So uh, maybe we can start with the bio war, uh, bio warfare aspect. Uh, give us your take, Mr. Unz. Okay. Well, I mean, my views in some ways probably are much more conventional and closer to the mainstream than some of the uh, issues that you've raised. When the epidemic obviously first began, it suddenly appeared in the city of Wuhan, China. And then at first, there really nobody knew what was behind it. And so, you know, obviously, after a few months, the conventional wisdom, the establishment opinion settled on it being a natural virus. And that was basically supported by articles that came out in Nature, Medicine and Science. And the entire media shifted over to that perspective. So in other words, really for about a year, the establishment position in the media was that it was a natural virus that unfortunately leaked into the human population and was devastating the world for that reason. Now, you know, that certainly was possible. But a few months ago, there's suddenly that what I guess could be called almost a propaganda bubble ended up bursting. And uh, particularly uh, a longtime science journalist named Nicholas Wade who'd been editor, science editor at the New York Times and spent decades there, came out with a very long and detailed analysis pointing to the fact that there's very little evidence that's a natural virus. And if it's not a natural virus, he argued that the, natu that the obvious alternative was that it was an artificial virus produced in a laboratory that leaked out of Wuhan, China. Now, those are the two issues. Those are the two possibilities that have been widely debated in the media over the last six or eight months, either a natural virus, which was the previous conventional opinion, 
or a lab leak, an artificial virus that leaked out of Wuhan, China. And it seems to me the interesting thing about the debate is that there's an obvious third possibility, which just as you say, has been discussed in fringe areas of the internet from the beginning, but it has really been confined to those fringe areas. And the third possibility is that it was a deliberate biowarfare attack. In other words, the virus was biologically engineered to be moderately lethal, but extremely, extremely contagious. And so, in effect, it was designed to be an anti-economy biowar bioweapon, not an anti-personnel bioweapon, in that with the fatality rate of about 0.5 to 1%, obviously it wouldn't wipe out a population, but it would kill a sufficiently large fraction of the population. And it was so extremely contagious that countries that were infected with it would have to take drastic measures that would disrupt their economy to control it. And that's exactly what happened in China. In other words, when you're looking at the details of the original incident in China, the virus appeared in Wuhan, China, according to all of the best estimates, towards the end of October or towards the beginning of November. That was patient zero. Now, that would have allowed exactly the right amount of time for the virus to become an unstoppable epidemic around the time of the Lunar New Year travels in China. In other words, Lunar New Year is a tremendously important uh, holiday in China. It's the equivalent of Christmas, New Year's, and a number of other things put together, with 450 million Chinese traveling. Wuhan is a key transit hub. So to the extent that the virus became widespread in Wuhan invisibly, before the government noticed what was happening and during the Lunar New Year travels, it would have infected the entire country and had a devastating impact on China's economy. Now, the virus appeared exactly at the peak of America's global confrontation with China. And the suspicion that you know the two events connected is really a fairly obvious one. Furthermore, when you look at some of the details of what had been happening in China the previous two years, in 2018, there was a mysterious viral epidemic that had devastated China's poultry industry. In 2019, there was a mysterious viral epidemic that appeared in China and destroyed 40% of China's pig herds, its primary meat source. So we're talking about a virus appearing in 2018 attacking its food supply, a virus appearing in 2019, attacking another source of food supply, and then a virus appearing in at the end of 2019 that could have devastated China's economy in exactly that sort of way. Now, as it happens, when we look at some of the other events that really would make anybody very suspicious, uh, in 2017, before these viral epidemics began, a man named Robert Cadillac was brought into the Trump administration. For decades, he'd been one of America's leading biowarfare experts, an advocate of biowarfare as being a very useful and plausibly deniable means of damaging or severely disrupting an international adversary. So he was brought in in 2017. And then in 2018 and 2019, these food supply viruses appeared that inflicted a tremendous amount of damage in China. Furthermore, when we look at the events of 2019, and we're talking about really ridiculous things. I mean, from January to September 2019, Robert Cadillac's department ran something called the Crimson Contagion Exercise, which was a federal state planning process as to how America officials would guard America from suffering any damage, suffering infection from a respiratory virus that might suddenly appear in China. So we're talking about Robert Cadillac, America's chief biowarfare expert, running this exercise from January to August 2019. And two months later, exactly that sort of virus appeared in China. I mean, the coincidences are really absolutely ridiculous. And, you know, we're talking about when something is called the crimson contagion exercise, it sounds like a bizarre conspiracy theory that, you know, was invented on a corner of the Internet. The way I found out about it is there was a front page story in The New York Times describing it in all the details. So what we're talking about are basically a tremendous amount of circumstantial evidence pointing towards America 
elements of the American national security establishment inflicting a viral epidemic on China for very obvious reasons. In other words, China right now has one of the fastest growing world economies. And in fact, by most measures, it already surpassed America's economy in size several years ago. How in the world could China be controlled? How could America maintain its dominant position? I mean, you know, China, for example, has a, a suite of carrier killer missiles, you know, uh, long range missiles that could easily destroy a carrier fleet. We've been trying various means to sort of hinder the Chinese economy, damage Chinese companies like Huawei. But when we're talking about economy that large, growing that rapidly, and these days closely allied with the massive natural resources of Russia, I, I think the only plausible means of dealing China a severe blow would be something like a biowarfare attack. So, you know, that in a sense was the starting point. And when I first in Jan late January and early February began hearing of this mysterious virus appearing in the city of Wuhan, I started wondering and, you know, having a few suspicions here and there, but more and more evidence gradually accumulated. And I, I think at this stage, it becomes by far the most plausible scenario, despite the fact that it's been entirely, entirely avoided by not only the mainstream media, but virtually all of the alternative media as well. The number of alternative media websites that even raise the possibility of the COVID virus being an American biowarfare attack are virtually nil. I mean, I'm not saying none, but I mean virtually none. And it just seems very strange when all the evidence obviously points in such an obvious direction. I, I might as well raise a few more points. And again, this is information that came straight from the mainstream media, from the New York Times that I read very carefully every morning. Soon after the outbreak of the original Wuhan virus in Wuhan, the virus suddenly jumped 3,000 miles to the city of Gom in Iran, the holy city of Gom, which was the center of their religious and political elites. Now, you know, if you're talking about a virus spreading from Wuhan, China, the most logical places you'd expect it to go next would be the other East Asian nations bordering China. And that's exactly where a few outbreaks did occur. But the virus then suddenly jumped all the way to Iran. And in fact, the headline in the New York Times described Iran as being the second epicenter, the second global epicenter of the virus. Not only that, but it specifically targeted Iran's political elites. 10% of the Iranian parliament ended up being infected. Some of the top Iranian officials ended up being infected and a number of them died. So we're talking about a virus epidemic that occurred in Iran just a few weeks after America had assassinated Iran's top military leader. I mean, the whole thing is ridiculous and nobody ended up bringing up any of these points. So, you know, we're talking about the two countries in America, in the world that America was most at loggerheads with at that point were China and Iran. And they were the two countries struck down by this virus. Now, some of the other points you, ra you raised in your introduction, are you know some of the suspicions that have sped, especially in certain elements of the alternative media, that this is a coordinated plot by most of the governments of the world working together behind the scenes. Now, I, I can't rule anything out, but it seems to me really fairly implausible. The, the idea would be that America, China, Russia, Iran, Israel, and all of these other major countries in the world that are ferociously hostile to each other in every particular way would be secretly coordinating their joint use of a virus. Now, anything's possible, but it seems to me that's a much less likely possibility than the simple case that when a vir mysterious viral outbreak occurs in China and Iran, when America is most hostile to China and Iran, and America has spent eight months preparing for defense against a viral outbreak before it actually occurred, I think the most likely scenario is simply that, you know, it happened exactly the way you'd expect. Now, uh, before, you know, then I, it's probably easier to get into some of the questions you could raise about that. But one thing I should say is that once the virus spread to the United States, then the reaction of the Trump administration was so incompetent and this is so lazy and incompetent and ignored the whole problem. I think it's extremely unlikely that Trump himself 
was aware of what had happened. In other words, he basically claimed the virus didn't exist. It wasn't a problem. It would vanish by itself. He was so lackadaisical that we ended up having a massive outbreak in our country. And, you know, from that point of view, I think it almost entirely rules out the possibility that he himself had authorized the attack. Now, with most administrations, most countries around the world, the notion of the top leader of a country having not been involved in a major biowarfare attack against the country's leading international rivals would seem utterly absurd. But America is not a normal country these days. And the Trump administration was a very strange administration. If you've read some of the accounts that have come out, Trump's top aides and advisors would often run circles around him. They would, in some cases, they would hide his own executive orders hoping that he would forget that he planned to issue them. So under those circumstances, it's easy to imagine some of the top national security officials in the Trump administration deciding to deal a body blow to China, America's leading geopolitical rival, and perhaps also Iran, attack the Iran in leadership, and doing so without Trump's authorization. Now, my own speculation or informed speculation would be that All of the elements of the attack probably came from America's own national security establishment. In other words, the virus had probably been developed at uh, Fort Detrick or some other biowarfare facility. The virus was probably taken to China by elements of American special forces or CIA operatives or something like that. And all of those individuals believed that they were acting with the full authorization of the top American government. Well, on the other hand, the people actually involved were one notch down from Trump, probably a small group of officials who decided that they needed to strike a deep blow against China. And they basically authorized the attack on their own with all of the lower level officials, assuming that it had Trump's authorization, which it didn't. And then, you know, once the attack then caused massive blowback in the United States. I mean, by most estimates, probably about a million Americans have already died. It's the worst disaster to hit the United States since the Great Depression. It's the worst worldwide event, the most important worldwide event since the Second World War. So you can easily imagine those officials who were involved in it at the time, assuming that they did not intend for it to have blowback inside the United States, would now be very, very concerned that they're all might be found. And so you'd never get them to talk about it. I mean, a million Americans have died from it. And to say, oh, you know, we we thought it would stay in China. I mean, that's not, you know, an answer that anybody would accept. I I, add one more thing. What what we have to realize is that America for many years now, I, I would argue, has been run by its own propaganda ministry. Now, when a country has a very effective propaganda ministry, it has many powerful elements It's able to influence the world in ways that countries like China, Russia, whose media is much less dominant, are not able to do. But sometimes countries then start believing their own propaganda. For example, one very telling element that came out in late 2019, before the epidemic was at all known by anybody, was that international organizations ranked the countries in the world as best being able to cope with the sudden appearance of an epidemic. America was ranked best in the world. America would be more secure against any unexpected epidemic than any country in the world. Britain was ranked number two, and China was down around 40 or 50. So under those circumstances, it's easy to imagine that American national security officials would simply assume that America could control any sort of blowback that occurred here. Furthermore, when the original SARS virus appeared in China, At first, there was obviously a lot of international concern, but it stayed almost entirely in China, plus a few other East Asian countries, and never had any significant impact in the United States. The same thing with the MERS epidemic, which occurred in the Middle East. There was virtually no presence of MERS in the United States. So it's easy to imagine government officials thinking, well, you know, SARS was no problem, MERS was no problem. If we then launch a biowarfare attack in Wuhan, China, there's a pretty good chance it'll devastate the Chinese economy, put them out of business, maybe even cause the overthrow of the Chinese regime, total disruption in their society. Well, on the other hand, especially if we've spent eight months preparing in the Crimson Contagion exercises 
for coping with any sort of blowback in the United States. We'll be very prepared and there won't be any problem here. I mean, maybe a few Americans will die, but it won't be anything like the devastation that we're inflicting on China and to some extent Iran. So, I mean, that's basically the scenario I'm looking at. You know, it's a very simple, straightforward idea. We don't have to deal with the idea of all these different hostile countries in the world together cooperating. We don't have to assume that the attack was especially well thought out. It wasn't, it didn't go through 18 different planning stages in the Pentagon. My guess is it was probably a small group of a handful of conspirators, including probably one or two people near the top of the Trump administration. They then enlisted elements of the national security establishment carrying it out with all of those individuals, assuming it was a fully authorized operation intended to basically severely damage America's main geopolitical rival. And, you know, under those circumstances, nobody expected it would have the impact in the United States it did. And then once it had that impact, America has been very, very ineffective at coping with the results because of our own incompetence, I think, rather than any deliberate scheme on the part of America's top leaders. And um, so, you know, in a sense, the only part of the scenario in my case, that differs from the orthodox mainstream narrative promoted by the media is that they've never considered the third option. They've considered there was a natural virus that might be an artificial lab leak, but they've never considered that it was the obvious case of a country inflicting a biowarfare attack against another country. And given that America has had the world's largest and most active biowarfare program going on 70 years now, and has spent so many billions of dollars, I think the figure is probably $100 billion on biowarfare research and development over the last 40 or 50 years. You know, if you build all these biowarfare facilities, at some point, somebody might decide to use them, even if the president isn't informed. And so that's, you know, the rough scenario I'm talking about. Yeah, I think it's Chekhov's gun at the beginning of the play. If there's a loaded gun, it's going to go yeah. off uh, by the end. And I think there's a lot. A lot of us agree with with what you said. I've I've many in the alternative media and uh, Whitney Webb, who I've interviewed, and I've long held the, the same view as you that whatever's going on has come out of the the West. Um, that it was led by the West. Uh, you know, Francis Boyle, I think, would agree that uh, I think he thinks it comes from the Francis from F Fort Detrick or, or wh wherever. Um, I just interviewed a Dutch academic, uh, Kees van der Pale, who had a long chapter in his book about the bio warfare stuff that, that would agree with you. Uh, Robert Kennedy Jr., as you mentioned, also has a big chapter on that um, and a few others that I'm forgetting. So I would largely agree that whatever's going on is instigated from the West. Uh, I guess then one of, and I would also mention, you mentioned Crim Crimson Contagion. There's a lot of other simulations. We had 2017 oh, Spars, uh, Spars yeah. uh, simulation. And then I think also in 2019, you had, we had the event 201 in October, you had urban outbreak. I think it was also September, October, 2019, but it was interesting in September of 2019, um, the Chinese held in Wuhan, a, a simula I guess it was maybe a, a minor simulation simulating a coronavirus outbreak. So who knows, maybe the Chinese caught wind of what was going on and they were doing a simulation to, to prepare like a contingency. Uh, and I would just add that in 2019, I was living in Kazakhstan at the time, right near to China. And in December of 2019, my whole family and I uh, got a really bad case of like symptoms of like pneumonia or similar to, to COVID. It was, it was really strong. So again, that would be anecdotal evidence adding to what you're saying. Um, and then I guess the question would be, if we're talking about this in the context of the new Cold War, biological warfare, you said it was a punch against China's uh, economy, supply chain. Um, like you think they met Th their goal or was maybe it was it maybe like a first phase and you know what do they expect is there a second phase to this uh, attack uh and as well hasn't it damaged uh, america's uh, and europea europe's and canada's economy and supply chains oh entirely i mean what what i should say is that also with regards to those exercises the crimson contagion exercise the event 201 exercise I don't think there's any hard evidence that any of the people associated with those exercises were aware of what was happening. In other words, under the scenario I'm talking about, a small group of conspirators decided to launch these attacks. Probably the, uh, the initial 2018 and 2019 viral epidemics targeting China's poultry and, uh, pig and uh, pork supply were you know, obviously 
put in place years before. But in terms of the anti-human, the anti-personnel attack that occurred in the end of 19, 2019, if a small group of individuals were planning something like this, it's easy, and they were near the top of the American government, it's easy to imagine that they just casually shifted other groups into thinking about the idea. It's not that they would go, for example, to the uh, World Economic Forum people or these other groups doing the exercise and saying, we expect we will be launching a biowarfare attack against China in eight months or in a year. But it's more that they would urge those people about the dangers of biowarfare, the dangers of a mysterious virus suddenly appearing, and suggest that exercises be held to protect America against any unexpected health threat of that type. So in other words, simply because these, organ these exercises were organized by a certain group doesn't mean that group was at all informed of what was happening. But they probably would have been in the general orbit of those people who were informed and were organizing it. And they would have simply shifted efforts in that direction so as to protect America. And the end result, I mean, the, the point about it is the only reason China was able to control the epidemic, I mean, China didn't even know that the virus was there until right at the end of December, just a few weeks before the Lunar New Year holiday travels. And with Wuhan being a key transit hub for the entire country, if China had not reacted the way it did, the virus would have spread throughout the entire country and become endemic and uncontrollable with tremendous disruption for China. The point is, China controlled the epidemic through the largest uh, uh, lockdown, an unprecedented lockdown in history that was a, a 700 million Chinese were temporarily locked down throughout the entire country, a lockdown a thousand times larger than the largest lockdown in the history of the world. Nobody would have expected the Chinese government to take such incredibly forceful action that way. I mean, they've never done anything like that before. And if they hadn't taken such action, the disease would have spread out the entire country with devastating results for China's society and economy. When the disease then started leaking back into the United States, China had successfully controlled it through that sort of lockdown. I, I think what probably happened was that since America botched the production of its first CDC testing kit, and the Trump administration just sort of ignored the problem and hoped it wouldn't occur here, but basically the disease started spreading here. And since the government didn't really know what to do, some of the local state authorities, starting with actually my own uh, health authority here in Santa Clara County and Silicon Valley, and later in California, implemented the same sort of lockdown because it had succeeded in China. In other words, if you're faced with a very highly contagious, dangerous disease, and you don't know what to do with it, you simply would look at what was happening in China and say that, well, if they controlled it, maybe we should take the same action. And that, you know, I, I don't think there was any nefarious aspect to that that was done. And in fact, at first, the Trump administration was very hostile to the notion of these lockdowns and resisted them initially. But when the disease started spreading exponentially and it hit New York City so hard very early on, including it killed one of Trump's friends and it ended up devastating a lot of the elite uh, Wall Street uh, groups and everything like that. You know, there was a feeling that, well, we have to do something. And so the lockdown measure was the only thing really anybody could think of. Now, originally, the lockdown was proposed as something that would just last two or three or four weeks. But the problem with the Western lockdowns is they weren't anything like as severe and harsh as the Chinese lockdowns. What the Chinese did was have an extremely, extremely sharp lockdown that lasted for a few weeks. And within a month or two, most of the country was back to normal. And within two or three months, virtually the entire country was back to normal because they stamped out the virus. The problem with the American lockdowns was that they were so porous, so leaky that they really ended up not being successful. And since they weren't successful and the government couldn't think of anything else to do, the government continued the lockdowns off and on, turning them on, turning them off for really most of a year. So we ended up getting the worst of both worlds. We ended up having severe damage to our society and our economy because of the disruptions caused by the lockdowns, while still probably about a million Americans died. And I mean, the disease spread out through the entire country I and mean, probably probably about half of the American population ended up getting infected or something like that. 
So, you know, it ended up being a total disaster for the United States, but I, I don't think it was an intentional disaster. The fact that the government kept on changing its position, first they were opposed to lockdowns, then they supported lockdowns. Some states had them, some states didn't. I mean, that's the sort of total disorganization you'd, affect, you'd expect from a very incompetently run government that doesn't really know what to do rather than a sort of centrally planned diabolical scheme to impose totalitarianism on the United States. So, you know, I, I think basically what we're looking at is tremendous American incompetence, which we've seen in a lot of other areas. I mean, the fact that, you know, when we left, I mean, there are, our, you know, flight from Afghanistan has got to be one of the most humiliating things any, you know, major country has suffered. We were there for 20 years. We left, we thought the regime would last at least six months or a year, and it fell in five days, 10 days, something like that, a total humiliation. So, you know, the fact that basically America's government is so incompetent in so many different ways today, I think makes it much more plausible that they were incompetent with regard to stamping out the virus. And most Western governments have had exactly the same sort of problem. So, you know, that, that's basically my take. It's not malevolence for most of these government officials, except for probably a tiny handful who were involved in the biowarfare plot. I think it's more just total incompetence. Do you think then, um, so if this was a Western attack, biowarfare bio attack against China and the East, do you think, um, and, you know, and China knows this, do you think there will be further consequence, consequences now? So we've seen like everyone's economy is basically damaged. Um, so do you think this will increase the chance, chances of an escalation of, of a conventional or even unconventional conflict with China, you know, nuclear war, there's this talk about Taiwan, and we see, we're, we're seeing what's happening with China's ally, Russia and Ukraine yeah. now. Um, do you think this bio war has increased, um, th that it will increase the possibility of uh, greater conflict uh, in the near future? Well, I mean, certainly we're right now in a very dangerous situation with both China and Russia with the Ukraine and with Taiwan. But I don't think those are directly connected with what I strongly suspect was a biowarfare attack. First of all, there's no proof it was an American biowarfare attack. I, I doubt whether the Chinese have any hard proof. In other words, it seems very plausible. Anybody can look at these pattern of events and a few more things I can also discuss. But you know, it's very different to have very strong suspicions of what happened and have actual proof of it. And since America and the West totally dominates the world media, if Chinese level, if the Chinese level those sorts of accusations, unless they had hard proof, I think everybody would basically just consider it was Chinese insanity. And you know, that's how the American media would portray it. In fact, one of the interesting things that I discovered, you know, as I said, the fact that the virus jumped so rapidly in just a few weeks from Wuhan, China, to the holy city of Gom in Iran, and hit the political elites in Iran, the only political elites in the world that have suffered such severe damage right after we assassinated Iran's top military official. You know, when that happened, I really thought to myself, you know, months or a year later, why didn't the Iranians suspect anything? You know, it seems so obvious what had happened. And then I discovered not only that the Iranians believed it was a biowarfare attack, but they publicly accused the United States of lying, launching a biowarfare attack. Their media outlets said they believed the COVID outbreak in Iran was an American biowarfare attack directed against their government for obvious reasons. In fact, the former president of Iran filed a formal complaint with the United Nations accusing America of having launched a biowarfare attack. But nobody in the West ever heard about it because the West controls the international media. So that, you know, it, even though it was covered in the Iranian media and the Iranian top officials accused America, nobody in America found out. It was never in the New York Times. It was never in the mainstream media. In fact, very few people, even in the alternative media, are aware that Iran specifically accused America of launching a biowarfare attack. And in some respects, I think Iranian media is stronger globally than Chinese media. The Chinese media is much more insulated and, you know, it's obviously very dominant in China, but it's really not very strong around the rest of the world. So I think if China made these sorts of accusations, they would be ridiculed as being totally ridiculous, just the way the Iranian accusations have been ridiculed and denounced as ridiculous. So, you know, the other way of looking at it also is that according to all the estimates 
you know, we have the Chinese suffered a few thousand dead, I think about three or four thousand dead from the virus, almost no damage to their economy. Life in China went back to almost entirely normal within two or three months after the outbreak. And for a, two years now, life in China has been basically what it was before the outbreak. Though every now and then there are small new outbreaks that they have to crack down on in particular cities. Meanwhile, America suffered a million dead. And our society has been devastated. Now, if anybody, if the Chinese wanted to punish America for having launched this attack against them, what more could they do? I mean, America suffered a million dead. I mean, we basically had tremendous disruption in our societies. Uh, most Americans spent a year or two years, much of it under lockdown. I mean, I can't think of anything more that anybody could do to us. So it's the old story of if you launch an arson attack, against, for example, your neighbor's house, but he puts down the fire and it spreads to your house and burns down your own house. You know, your neighbor may be angry at you, but, you know, your house has been burned down. And so it's not really clear what more he could inflict on you. And it's not just America. The whole West has been devastated. I mean, basically, the Western world, America, Britain, Italy, France, Spain, Germany, all of our NATO allies have been hit very hard by this virus. And it might come back again. I mean, you know, it's perfectly possible there might be another strain that would appear that would inflict a fifth wave on American society, while the Chinese have suffered almost nothing at all. So, you know, it's clear right now there is certainly the danger of war with China or war with Russia over Ukraine or over Taiwan. But those are the flashpoints rather than this possibility of America having launched a biowarfare attack against China. And in any event, it wasn't something done by the American government. I mean, a sign of how, under the scenario I'm talking about, a sign of how disorganized and incompetent the American government has become, the American regime has become, is that if this attack occurred, it occurred without the approval of the top American political leadership, which is, I mean, something like that is almost unthinkable in modern American history. I can't think of uh, modern world history. I can't think of any situation where this sort of attack would have been launched by one country against a major rival without the top leadership of that country even being aware of what had happened. And Trump's behavior, I mean, makes me extraordinarily skeptical that he was aware of what was happening. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we've seen clips where they were uh, at press conferences, and I think people will remember Trump turns to Mike Pompeo, like saying they were talking about something about a live exercise, and Trump's like, you, you didn't tell me about this. And so that kind of confirms what you're saying. Um, sure. One thing that comes to mind was, I, I don't know if you've seen it, but you know, Whitney Webb and others have talked about the, the 2010 uh, Rockefeller lockstep report, which predicts in 2010, um, and, and many, you know, Robert Kennedy and others have documented that they've been running these pandemic simulations for two decades now. So there was this Rockefeller report in 2010 saying that a virus would come out of China and that China would react, as you laid out, that they have, you know, very quickly, very harshly uh, locking down and stopping the virus, but that the rest of the world, the, the report was basically saying that the rest of the world should do the same and that the rest of the world starts to implement measures that kind of remain permanent that don't go away and that the, kind of many other countries follow china's model and the west starts to become more authoritarian and my biggest fear now we have these digital passports and i mean just to get your thought on on these digital passports like you know it, it seems like they're not going to go away and so then we're going to need permission to do everything based on these passports there's people now in a state another state here in mexico you can't go into a supermarket without the passport that verifies that you've been uh you, you know you can't buy food unless you've been vaccinated you can't go to the park unless you've been vaccinated in italy pensioners can't go into the bank to get their pension unless they they've got the digital passport i i'm i'm kind of afraid of this because i feel later things can be added to this if it's not taken away you know other requirements besides uh, vaccines so have you thought about this part, like, um, you know, the vaccine passports? Well, I, I don't really, I, uh, with the whole, with regard to the vaccination issue, I mean, as far as I can tell, based on what I've read in the media and what I followed, I mean, the vaccines seem ineffective at preventing uh, infection or transmission of the virus, but they do seem to drastically reduce the lethality of the virus if you do become infected. So, you know, overall, I think probably 
it's perfectly logical that the government would support these vaccination efforts the way they have. And I don't have any strong feelings about that. In other words, I think probably these vaccination mandates are a bad idea and also an illogical one, since the vaccines aren't really all that effective in preventing people from becoming infected or transmitting the virus, but only in a sense, help the individual person from surviving a bout of the virus. It seems to me forcing people to va become vaccinated doesn't make much sense since it's not really a communal good. It's more of a personal issue. And if people don't want to become va vaccinated and end up getting much, much more sick or even die as a consequence, you know, that in a sense is more of their own decision to make. And, you know, I, I certainly agree that the way the government has handled this has been very, you know, disorganized and counterproductive. And, you know, it's perfectly possible that these vaccines are much more dangerous than past vaccines, especially because they've undergone so little testing compared to traditional vaccination policies. But on the other hand, and you know, it's also very possible that certain elements of American society or the American government or the American economy might take advantage of this crisis for their own ends. So for example, some of these restrictions being imposed, or for example, the fact that the crisis was used to open the spigots of the Federal Reserve and boost the stock market incredibly. I mean, you know, in a ridiculous way. I mean, trillions of dollars flowing into the stock market. I mean, that certainly, you know, was a bad policy on the part of the American government. And I, I think it reflects the power of some of these groups that were able to take advantage of the crisis to implement these policies. But that's a long way from saying that they were actually behind the policy, behind the crisis in the first place. And, you know, to give you an example, when the financial meltdown took place in 2008, you know, the uh, the uh, Wall Street uh, mortgage bubble, a lot of these same groups were able to get massive bailouts of the financial services industry. They didn't create the financial crisis, but they were able to use their political power to bail out all their banks and other organizations and, you know, basically take advantage of, they get trillions in federal funding. So, you know, just because somebody takes advantage of a crisis doesn't necessarily mean that had anything to do with fostering it. And the fact that America, for example, had had these training exercises for a number of years, I mean, in some ways, you know, once the SARS epidemic broke out in China in 2002, 2003, with a very high lethality rate, I think it was probably 15% lethal or 20% lethal, you know, it only basically, fortunately, didn't spread very rapidly. And it was only contagious after somebody showed symptoms. So that's the reason they were able to stamp it out. But once you have a deadly virus like that appearing in China, it seems not entirely implausible that world health organizations or the international bodies you mentioned would consider the possibility of future viruses appearing, especially after MERS appeared then, or I think around 2007, 2008. So it's not totally surprising that some of these organizations would have staged, would have organized plans or exercises in 2010 or 2012 or 2014 to cope with the same sort of thing. The, now, the example I was citing, though, was a very specific exercise that was held in the United States by our chief biowarfare expert from January to August 2019, when the virus then uh, to deal with the outbreak of a respiratory virus that would appear in China. And that respiratory virus appeared in China two months after the end of the exercise. So, you know, when you're talking about coincidences, that's much you know, sharper than something that might have happened in 2010 or 2012. There's actually one other example I should cite, which I, I think personally represents the closest thing we have to a smoking gun in the entire situation. And that's once America showed itself entirely unable to cope with this massive disaster in the country. In other words, when tens of thousands of Americans were becoming infected and dying, when the Trump administration couldn't figure out what to do, and when the media, which was obviously very hostile to Trump, was ferociously attacking him on all those grounds, then ABC News came out with a very interesting story. Four American intelligence officials went to ABC News and explained to them that the disaster that we were suffering was not their fault, not the fault of the American intelligence community, but the fault of the top political leaders like Donald Trump. What they said was, 
they themselves had produced a secret intelligence report, which they distributed to Trump and all of our top officials, describing a dangerous, possibly catastrophic disease epidemic breaking out in Wuhan, China, and that it was the fault of Trump and our top officials who didn't take that report seriously and didn't do anything to cope with the disaster, which is exactly what intelligence officials to do. They would want to cover themselves by saying it wasn't they who were asleep at the switch. It was Trump or the top government officials. And that story got on ABC. It got a lot of attention. I think it ended up getting 1,800 comments. It was massively covered in the media. And then suddenly somebody noticed something. The date at which the report had been distributed was November. November was before anybody was aware of the outbreak in Wuhan, China. The the Chinese government didn't become aware of it until over a month later. Most of the estimates are that uh, most of the estimates, when people have tried to back in when patient zero occurred, most of the estimates based on the epidemiological and genetic studies that they've done show that Patient zero, the first person infected in Wuhan, China, probably occurred towards the end of October or the beginning of November. So that secret government report by the American Defense Intelligence Agency that was distributed to top leaders was produced before anybody was aware of the outbreak in China. Now, once people realized that, immediately the Defense Intelligence Agency uh, announced that the report didn't exist, you know, even though it had four intelligence sources who'd revealed its existence to ABC News and had been promoted very heavily. They said, no, nope, it was a false report. The report never existed. But then Israeli TV, a couple of weeks later, came out with a report saying, oh, of course, the report existed. It had been sent to Israel. It had been sent to our NATO allies. And the report had been produced in the second week of November. So we're talking about a report, a secret government report by the Defense Intelligence Agency, describing a potentially catastrophic disease outbreak taking place in Wuhan, China, when there were probably five or 10 people in a series of in a city of 11 million who'd so far become infected and were just starting to feel a little bit sick. There was absolutely no way the American government could have known of it. And so under those circumstances, when the Defense Intelligence Agency distributes a secret intelligence report warning of a catastrophic disease outbreak taking place in Wuhan, China, before there is a catastrophic disease outbreak in Wuhan, China, that seems awfully close to a smoking gun. And again, it reinforces the idea that those elements of the American government that had been behind the attack decided to further strengthen America's defenses by probably leaking the report to some people in the defense intelligence agencies, saying that they had some secret intelligence, that there was some sort of disease outbreak going on in Wuhan, China, and that we should gird our defenses against it. So in other words, we had planning exercises for what happened. We had a secret intelligence report for what happened. We were preparing, our elements of our government were preparing themselves as much as possible to cope with the threat of a disease outbreak. But when it actually happened, the rest of our government was just so incompetent and lackadaisical that those efforts really had no impact at all. Oh, and one other thing I should mention, another remarkable coincidence. And this came out very early, towards the end of January. Wuhan, China is a city that most Americans have probably never heard of, and I'd certainly never heard of it until the outbreak took place. It's a large city, it, you know, would be the equivalent of like a Midwestern city like Chicago that doesn't have the visibility of a New York or San Francisco, but it's certainly a major transit hub. Now, it turns out, again, the epidemiological and genetic and genetic mutational evidence tends to show that patient zero, the initial outbreak, occurred towards the end of October or the beginning of November. And that was known fairly early on. That was the estimate people focused on. And then it turns out, I found out from a Chinese blogger that right towards the end of October, Wuhan had been host to the international military games in which 300 American military officers participated along with thousands of servicemen from around the world. So we had 300 American servicemen going to Wuhan, China, and exactly at the time when they were there is when the initial disease outbreak seems to have occurred. Now, there have been some statements, some claims that, for example, some of them may have been infected, some of the participants may have been infected, and there seems very, very little evidence of that. In fact, almost no evidence at all. 
But on the other hand, if you have thousands of military servicemen from around the world, including 300 Americans participating in the military games in Wuhan, China, doing sightseeing in the city and everything like that, that would have been an ideal opportunity for America to have slipped a couple of operatives into that group who would then have surreptitiously released the virus. So in other words, it, you know, it, normally China is more of a closed society, and it's not easy to probably send operatives there to release the virus in a major city, especially a city like Wuhan, which doesn't have the high profile Shanghai or Beijing. But if you have thousands of military servicemen from all over the world in that city, traveling around sightseeing, that would be the absolutely ideal cover to do something like that. So maybe it's an entire coincidence, but we are talking about a situation. If 300 Chinese military servicemen had visited Chicago and immediately after they left, we suddenly had a mysterious viral outbreak in that city, a lot of Americans would be extraordinarily suspicious. So we're talking about putting together all of these different strands. And I think most of these strands, the fact that there seemed to be so much preparation that was done on America's part to prepare against such an outbreak leaking back into the United States, tends to decrease the likelihood that any sort of outbreak in the United States was intentional. And you know, anyway, we're talking about basically China being hit, Iran being hit, and then the virus spreading to these other European countries. And it's not clear why anybody would want to hit Italy or hit Spain or hit Britain. And I think those outbreaks were exactly what they seem to be. In other words, when you look at a country like Italy, the outbreak took place in northern Italy, Lombardy area, where there are 300,000 Chinese living and working. And it occurred right after Chinese Lunar New Year. And so probably hundreds or thousands of them had traveled home, many of them to Wuhan, and had come back to uh, Italy. And then, you know, naturally they spread the virus there. In the same way, the virus then broke out in Spain. And there are 150,000 Chinese living in Spain there. So you'd expect it to happen there. Well, on the other hand, the whole Iran has one of the world's lowest Chinese populations. Only a few thousand Chinese live in Iran, and almost all of them live in Tehran, the large capital city. Very few of them in Gom, while on the other hand, it was the holy city of Gom where the disease suddenly broke out. So you really would have to say that if you were producing a list of the most likely cities where an outbreak in Wuhan, China would soon spread, you know, you'd expect cities in East Asia, you know, if you realize that 300,000 Chinese are living and working in Lombardy, you might expect it to go to Italy, you might expect the United States because we have a large Chinese population. But probably the holy city of Gom would be absolute lowest on your list around the world for the disease to suddenly spread there. And that's the second place it appeared after Wuhan, China, targeting China's political and military elites right after America had assassinated Iran's top military leader. So in the same way, just as you were saying about, you know, sort of war with China, I just can't see the Chinese, you know, feeling that anything like that is necessary after the devastation that we've suffered. And then the same way, you know, with Russia, I mean, Russia has suffered very much from the outbreak as well, I think mostly because it leaked into that country. But the flashpoint with Russia right now is over the Ukraine, obviously. And so, I think basically America, elements of the American government were probably involved in the attack. It backfired horrendously. It's the worst blowback in the history of the human species. It's probably worse than every other example of blowback in world history combined. And I think, you know, the sooner that America admits and the sooner the American media starts recognizing what probably happened, I think the sooner we may start realizing that biowarfare weapons that we've probably spent $100, million, $100 billion on over the years are just too dangerous to have around. And they're a very bad thing to put in the hands of people who could end up using them. Yeah, and just on your point about black ops, black operations, I mean, that, that's how they work. We can see in many historical examples of whether it's the CIA's shenanigans, you know, during the Cold War or, you know, Operation Gladio by, by NATO, they're usually carried out by small, small groups who are in the know, while the rest of the, as you said, governmental uh, apparatus uh, does not know about them. Uh, I guess, given everything that you, you've laid out, you know, how do you see the pandemic ending? Will it ever end? You know, where do we go from here? Um, you commented on the military aspect. You don't think there will be 
you know, a military war with uh, China, but do you f see any other fallout, whether political, social, economic, you know, uh, where do we go from here? Well, it's very difficult to tell what direction things will go. I mean, we're talking about, again, I think the most impactful global event since the Second World War, something you know, far greater than any other event. You know, the disruption to our society, just as you say, all these vaccine passports, you know, the tremendous changes taking place, it's very difficult to say where things will go, even if there are no additional a strains of the virus that end up producing additional waves. I mean, you know, it's very difficult to say. One thing I really should say is that it, it is a little bit shocking to me that both the mainstream and so much of the alternative media have refused to even consider these possibilities. I mean, just to give an example, a few weeks ago, I ended up looking at uh, the Wall Street Journal had a full page of book reviews on all the major books that have come out right now looking at the possible origins of the virus. And most of them now focus on the lab leak hypothesis. That seems to be where most of them are heading, you know, a man-made virus that leaked out of the Wuhan lab. But none of them, none of them even raise the possibility of a deliberate biowarfare attack, despite all of this evidence that I've laid out. And that's even true of the alternative media. I mean, an awful lot of alternative media people seem very reluctant to simply raise these possibilities, partly because it might be, you know, too worrisome that, you know, if America basically, I mean, 20 million people probably have died around the world, probably 4 million people in India, a million people in the United States. I mean, we're talking about a massive disaster that very likely was due to rogue elements of the American government of Donald Trump. And the irony is that you have all of Trump's enemies in the media who've attacked him on every possible ground. The fact that he sent out a nasty tweet against somebody at 2 a.m. But the, for, they've been very determined to avert their eyes from the very real likelihood that some of the people he hired and put into place at the top of administration were involved in this disastrous biowarfare attack that has killed a million Americans. So, you know, it seems to me the first stage is for people at least to start discussing this issue. And, you know, I've done what I can for 20 or 20 two months now, I've written a series of articles. And the fact, one other thing I should mention, which is quite intriguing, is when my first article in the series came out, which was in April of 2020, it ended up getting massive coverage, massive media attention, more page views than anything I'd written for many, many years. And within days, our entire website was suddenly deranked by Google, and we were banned by Facebook. So obviously, when you're entirely deranked from Google and banned by Facebook, getting subsequent information out has proven much more difficult. And, you know, it could be that quite a lot of people, you know, look at that sort of pattern and say that, you know, they consider it something that they like to avoid discussing for fear of getting kicked off YouTube or kicked off Twitter or banned. And, you know, a number of people told me flat out that they're reluctant to discuss this with me on their podcasts because it could have negative impact on their career or something like that. And, you yeah, know, again, yeah. th those are perfectly valid personal reasons to have. But, I mean, we are talking about something that's killed a million Americans, that's devastated the world. And that, you know, one reason I think the media is so reluctant even to raise these issues is that the circumstantial and even more than circumstantial evidence for an American biowarfare attack is so overwhelmingly strong. The fact that it hit China and Iran right when we were in an international confrontation with China and Iran, the fact that we have the world's largest and most um, long-term biowarfare program. And the fact that, I mean, we'd had these exercises to guard against biowarfare blowback right before the biowarfare attack occurred. I mean, if the media ended up discussing any of these things, I think very quickly an awful lot of Americans would decide that they were probably true or you know, reasonably likelihood, and the whole thing would unravel. So in other words, nobody wants to be the first person to go first on something like that. Which, you know, is why I think, um, you know, it's up to the alternative media to try to at least get these ideas into circulation so that the mainstream media will have to at some point cover them or, you know, explain why they're not covering them. Yeah, I was just going to comment on the censorship issue. So, I mean, I was the first to do the interview with Boyle in January. I think I published it January 29th or 30th of 2020. And it was my biggest video, 300,000 views on, on YouTube. I would, it would have hit a million and Google deleted it, it's still deleted. 
And um, that, you know, that hurt my growth for, for the podcast because, you know, if it, if it would have kept going viral, it would have helped the podcast grow. But, not, you know, it's it's still banned. But I see now on YouTube, there are more videos, a few more videos discussing what we're talking about that are on YouTube. But in general, I think the pandemic uh, allowed them to exercise an insane amount of censorship. I, I mean, just just crazy that we haven't seen before, you know, deplatforming the president and you mentioning Google ranking. So my new website uh, just went live on uh, Friday, the, the weekend. And I noticed on the Google search engine, when I type in geopolitics and empire, it does not appear at all. Exactly. exactly. At all. And exactly. then I go, I, I go to DuckDuckGo, Swiss mm -hmm. Cows, Quants, Yandex, and you get the website. Right, my website is at the top and all of my other channels. But on Google, it's just gone. It's not, it doesn't, I don't exactly. exist. It's insane. Um, exactly. In fact, like one thing that happened to me, and I, you know, at that time, deranking wasn't as common as since become. So I was shocked when it happened. Uh, I'd actually done a lot of uh, writing on uh, racial and ethnic issues over the years. And one of my articles on crime rates, Hispanic crime rates, had spent 10 years as the number two ranked article in Google out of 200 million articles. So, you know, we're talking about something, you know, as large as anything. In fact, if you look at, for example, if you Google the word communism, you get something like 150 million pages, while Hispanic crime, you get 200 million. And it was ranked number two all those years. And I really was quite proud of it. Google disappeared. it, And in fact, uh, for about six or eight months afterwards, it was still ranked number one or number two on DuckDuckGo and Bing. But then, you know, a few uh, weeks ago, I checked and it disappeared from those as well. So in other words, you know, we're talking about a situation where Certain choke codes, certain gatekeepers on the internet can basically make whatever they want disappear, vanish from trace. And it's really, you know, a very unfortunate situation. And that's obviously happening to more and more people these days and becoming more of, you know, really a factor. And to give you another example, a Pulitzer Prize winner, one of the um, uh, one of the authors we've published, Sidney Schonberg, you might or might not know of his name. He's the guy who wrote the book uh, that became the Killing Fields movie. He won a Pulitzer Prize. He was a top editor at the New York Times. Uh, you know, The Killing Fields is one of those classic Vietnam War movies, probably, you know, it won, you know, a Oscar and everything like that. His article that we ran, it had to do with some of the background of John McCain. And it had been ranked always near the top of all the search engines for all those years. And then suddenly it was disappeared. And if you go on it, neither our website nor any other website has that article there. So, you know, it, it's basically... When you have a situation where a lot of things can be kept quiet, you know, you sometimes end up with very unfortunate developments happening like this. And that's why I think it's really the responsibility of the alternative media to start pressing these issues as much as possible to really force more people in the mainstream media to at least consider them. Yeah, and they, they've effectively put us in what my past uh, guest historian, Edwin Black, has called the algorithm uh, ghetto. I have one uh, just last question that may be slightly off topic, but just it's for me, it's also important. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious about the UNS Review's, uh, I guess, view or perspective ideology uh, here on geopolitics and empire. I talk to I talk to everyone kind of like what you do from the left and Marxists to conservatives to the right, libertarians and many others who don't fall into a cute little category and the vast majority of listeners love the fact that i have such a wide variety of guests mm -hmm. but with each episode i will get complaints about you know why i interviewed this commie or that right winger i simply don't care you know because it would be boring to pigeonhole myself into a single category and i think you do something similar on uns.com uh, in the about section on your website it says you are neither right wing or left wing but are both uh, could you speak you know to this and to the importance of listening to all viewpoints Oh, exactly. In other words, basically, we build ourselves as an alternative media website. In other words, we basically try to provide a mix of views from the right, right wing, left wing, libertarian, all sorts of different perspectives. And in fact, many of those perspectives, to be honest, are perspectives that I myself may not very much agree with, both on you know some of these racial or ethnic issues and also, for example, on some of these vaccination issues. And so we, we really try to offer as much of a broad spectrum of alternative perspectives as possible. And uh, I'd say probably, if I had to go through it, I'd say probably about 40% to 50% of our writers would be more classified as being on the right wing or conservative side. 
probably 30 to 40 percent on the left wing side, and then maybe another 20 percent or so difficult to characterize or libertarian or so mixed with so many different views, it would be hard really to put in the category. In some ways, I sort of would put myself in that same category. In other words, over the years, you know, in the past, I actually have been much more heavily involved with the mainstream media. You know, I published quite a lot in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or, you know, various right-wing magazines or the nation on the left wing and that sort of thing. So, you know, I've really always tried to look at issues on a case-by-case basis and draw my own conclusions based on where the evidence goes, you know, with my scientific background being sort of what drives me. And so, you know, most recently, in the last three or four years, I've really something started something that I call the American Pravda series, which has been really a very long series. It probably runs by now around three or 400,000 words. It's counting all the articles and dozens and dozens of articles. It's been viewed millions of many millions of times. And it really deals with a lot of the historical or other elements of American history for which there's a tremendous amount of solid evidence if you probe into it, but which is often ignored by the American media. In some ways, it functions as a counter narrative, as I say, of the last 100 years of of Western history, going back to the First World War, the Great Depression period, the Second World War, the more recent events since then. Some incidents that you know are sometimes put in the cons- in the conspiracy theory category, like the Kennedy assassinations or the 9/11 attacks, issues of the Second World War, or most recently, obviously the COVID outbreak. You know, which I think there is quite a lot of evidence was probably an American biowarfare attack against China and Iran. So, in effect, it deals with things that are covered by the media. I view in a very skewed way. And tries to go to the original sources and come up with a different perspective. So in some ways, it's certainly by far the longest and most comprehensive thing I've ever published. And even though the individual articles cover all these different areas, the common theme is that the mainstream history and the mainstream media can often not be trusted on controversial issues. All right. Yeah, I think I've read some of those. Uh, I read uns from from time to time. Um, And so, yeah. Uh, Is there any any final thought for us? Not really. I'm just hoping that, you know, I've actually done very few. This is one of my first video podcasts. And, you know, it was suggested to me that even though I've spent most of my time writing articles, probably getting these ideas out via podcasting with some of, you know, the podcasters like you and others, might be a useful means of spreading the ideas into circles that, you know, would be less likely to read some of my detailed articles. And also the other thing about it is sometimes when these ideas are presented orally or verbally or visually, certain aspects come across that might, you know, be missed in sort of a dry you know, written narrative. And so, you know, in the past, almost all of my work has been done either in written form or, you know, five or 10 years ago, I sometimes used to be on cable a certain amount of time. But I mean, this is sort of a new experience to me, and I'm really hoping to get a little bit more comfortable with it and get it out to a wider audience. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm having a knack for I'm always trying to find guests that no one is talking uh, mm. to. I, I'm kind of bored. There's a lot of people that do the podcast circuit. And I'm like, He's just going to tell me the same thing that he's told the 10 other podcasts. I'm trying to find you know, diamonds in the rough. And I've had a number of guests um, that have been uh, the, the first time they spoke with me was their first video exactly. podcast. So I'm always trying to find you know new, interesting uh, people. And this is kind of the, the market, like, as you said, like, uh, podcasting is growing and whether it's just the audio, you know, half of the people listen to just the audio version of this or the other half of the, the video. And so that's becoming popular. And, and just as you said, there are things that you kind of get from the audio or the video that you don't get from the, the text. Um, is apart from uns.com, are there any website, other websites or books or projects 
we should know about or just go to the website? Well, I mean, the website really would be sort of the main place for them. A lot of what we publish is simply material that we syndicate from other websites, right-wing websites, left-wing websites, independent bloggers, that sort of thing. We also publish uh, a number of, uh, a lot of material ourselves. And also one thing I'd actually done, and that had actually been what I'd spent most of the early 2000s working on, is to build up a massive content archive library of America's leading periodicals of the last 150 years. In other words, what I ended up doing was digitizing a couple of hundred of America's leading opinion publications of the last 150 years, you know, the complete archives, for example, of publications that are still around, like The Nation or The New Republic or Harper's, and then publications like Century Magazine or The Forum or, for example, Saturday Review, which were very important and dominant 50 or 60 or 80 years ago, but are forgotten right now. And one of the reasons I ended up actually starting on the American Pravda series is as I started going through those archives, I really discovered that much of my understanding of American history from 50 or 60 years ago, what I'd studied in you know, my college courses or in reading books, was very misleading. And when you actually read the articles, the articles that were published by America's leading periodicals of 80 or 100 years ago, they sometimes present a picture of history that's very different than what you would get in today's current media or in your college textbooks. And so that started me really thinking more about how there might be a lot of knowledge, a lot of factual information out there that I was simply unaware of. And that led me to start investigating a lot of these other historical issues, which I ended up putting into my series. So in other words, right now, the website has probably about a million or two million articles from all of these old publications available at your fingertips. And they used to be much more easily available on Google. But now, they're since we've been deranked from Google, they're harder to find. Though in many cases, this website is the only source of them anywhere on the internet. So people still find them because, you know, even if you're deranked and at the bottom of all of the Google searches, if there's nothing else anywhere else on the internet, you can still find it that way. So, and also I've ended up digitizing uh, quite a number of more recently published books of various controversial nature on a number of different subjects. So, um, you know, the website is really very large. I mean, we have, we probably get, oh, I think it's probably about, 20 or 30 million words of comments a month, something like that. So we get thousands of comments a day. And you know, many of the comments are very substantive. And I've actually built the website myself. I'm a software developer by recent background. And so a lot of the features on the website are fairly unique and I think make it much more useful for extended discussions that sometimes can go 200,000 words or 150,000 words. Mm -hmm. Just to give you one example. Uh, you know, I'm somebody very skeptical of a lot of the anti-vaxxing arguments that are out there about the vaccines being very dangerous. And I ended up actually doing a lengthy interview expressing my skepticism, which generated 200,000 words of mostly very hostile comments and critiques, and then was continued in two additional open threads on the same subject. So after about a month of that, we were actually were told that we probably had 2 million words written by anti-vaxxers on our website, which probably made it the single largest repository of anti-vaxxing argument anywhere on the internet, even though I disagreed with you know, the ideas involved. So it, the whole thing about it is we try to be very open to all these different perspectives. And uh, you know, people look on the website, they can see the different perspectives that we host, including my own. Yeah, it's very active. And, uh, you know, you, as you said, you, you've been nuked off of Facebook and deranked on Google. Hopefully they don't nuke the website. You know, there, there's been talk now of the, that's the final frontier, you know, trying to take down uh, websites and with the whole Joe Rogan Spotify thing now. And they've been in the last few years putting out, you know, the establishment putting out articles. They're angry that they can't touch podcasts. So now they're trying they've set their eyes on, on trying to take us down uh, podcasts but you know we've got the, the father the godfather of podcast adam curry i think he's working to to make uh podcast bulletproof to create a network to protect podcasts so hopefully uh they can't get to us uh touch our websites or or our podcasts all right so everyone be sure to bookmark ones.com as i said i often read material i often read material from there uh, in the description i'll leave a few key links that will lead listeners to key articles um 
uh, about what we've been talking about. Uh, give you it will give you, you know important background information. Uh, and again, Mr. Unz, thank you for being on Geopolitics and Empire. Hey, great to be here. I hope you enjoyed this Geopolitics and Empire podcast. The website is geopoliticsandempire.com, and I encourage you to sign up for the free email list that goes out with each podcast and every weekend with a collection of news headlines. The newsletter and website are our last lines of defense. We're being censored and deplatformed. It's nearly impossible to find Geopolitics and Empire on the Google search engine. We've been blacklisted. YouTube frequently takes down our videos with strikes, Facebook restricts our page, Reddit and Twitter take down posts, and after the Associated Press mentioned Geopolitics and Empire in a 2021 article co-written with NATO, our Patreon account was terminated. Vimeo also terminated our Pro account. The best free way to help Geopolitics and Empire is to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or elsewhere and subscribe to all of our media channels. You can find the video broadcast now on five platforms, Odyssey, Rockfin, Rumble, BitChute, and Brighteon. You can find the audio broadcast on the podcast ecosystem, SoundCloud, Apple, Spotify, and so on. My current favorite social media channels are Twitter and Telegram, but you can also find us on Gab, MeWe, Minds, Float, VK, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Finally, Geopolitics and Empire is in dire need of funding to continue. You can leave a donation, purchase a consultation with the host, or become a member to receive additional benefits. We also produce a weekly broadcast called Dissident Thinker for members and Rockfin subscribers only. We will continue to fight the good fight come hell or high water. Thank you for listening.